he continued for a postdoc uh, in Stanford University again, and uh, he was back. Uh, he came back to the Indian Institute of Science as a faculty in 2014, and he has been with us uh, ever since. Uh, Shridhar. Okay. Uh, great. Uh, thanks, Rishi, and uh, thanks to the organizers for uh, for this opportunity. Um, <coughs> So, um, can everybody hear me? Um, not too loud, not too quiet. Yeah, people in the back row. Okay. Great. All right. So today, <coughs> I'm going to tell you a little bit about uh, my past work on the subcortical control of attention. Right. Um, specifically, I'm going to emphasize a circuit that is an evolutionarily ancient part of the brain, buried deep within the brain, uh, called the uh, superior colliculus or the optic tectum and I'm going to tell you about how the circuit is responsible so for some interesting um, kinds of attention behaviors right um, <clears throat> okay so um, see if this works um, right so let's start by defining what attention is right so I'm going to define that by uh, showing you a small demo. Uh, some of you may have seen this demo already, uh, so please don't spoil it for the others. Uh, so in this demo, what I'm going to do is I'm going to present you with a series of flashing images. Right? There's going to be um, an image that's presented sequentially, uh, but there's going to be a, you know, the, the, it looks like the same image, but there is one important difference between two successive images. And if you spot the difference, I'd like you to raise your hand, right? Um, <clears throat> okay, let me try playing this. So it looks like the same image, but there is a difference between the two images. And if you spot the difference, oh wow, okay. There's some people who are really fast at this. Usually in about two minutes, half the audience has their hands up, so um, I think we are on the right track here. Yeah, there's the exponential there, it's taking off. All right, excellent. So, um, so in the interest of time, I'm gonna tell the rest of you what the change is. The change is actually the stack of books here, right? That's appearing and disappearing, right? So it's, um, it's quite amazing how we fail to notice things in front of our eyes, right? And uh, that's why the uh, title of this slide is, do we really see everything around us? In reality, our brain tricks us into believing we see everything around us, but that's not true. We only see a very sparse representation of the world. And uh, because, you know, that's evidenced by the fact that you had to really look around this image to find out what was changing, right? Even though all the information was there in front of your eyes to behold. Uh, but the moment I drew your attention to that stack of books, there was no problem. You could immediately identify what was changing, right? And so this is a, um, a very good demonstration of what uh, selective attention is, because our brain has to deal with a rich and ever-changing landscape of sensory information, right? It's a, it's a very rich and diverse landscape, but we only code a small part of it, and attention represents the ability to select the most important information to guide processing and behavior, right? Um, <clears throat> now, the study of attention is nothing new. Uh, William James, uh, more than a century ago, the American uh, philosopher, he defined attention as the taking position by the mind in clear and vivid form of one out of what seems several simultaneously possible objects or trains of thought, right? So he's emphasizing this idea of selection, selection of one among many things. <clears throat> and. Uh, our lab, as well as uh, many labs around the world, are very interested in uh, the brain mechanisms of attention, right? We're interested in what goes on in the brain, what underlies this remarkable capacity for attention. And most of the research has been concentrated on uh, brain areas on the surface of the brain. This is the top of the brain, also known as the forebrain or the cortex, right? A lot of this uh, research has been done on the surface of the brain, the, uh, the cortex. And just for those of you who have never seen a brain before, this is a side view of the brain, right? looking at it from the side of the ears. This is the front of the brain, back of the brain, up and down. And uh, several decades of research have identified two key areas that are involved in attention. One is this frontal area here called the prefrontal cortex, that's towards the front of the brain. And the other area is called the parietal cortex. That's a little towards the back of the brain. These two are thought to be important for attention. 
Now, how do they mediate attention? So typically, <coughs> these regions are thought to exert some kind of top-down control on sensory encoding areas. In this case, I'm showing you the visual cortex, but this could be any sensory encoding area, right? And so uh, how exactly do they, uh, you know, exert their top-down control? Uh, here's a little uh, graphic demonstrating that. So if you record the activity of neurons in the visual cortex, and let's say you present a little visual stimulus, um, and the activity of the neuron sort of goes like this, right? On the y-axis is the uh, response of the neuron in spikes per second. Again, many of you may know that neurons respond in spikes, and I'm counting up spikes here, uh, the spike rate, actually. So if I count up the response of the neuron in spikes per second, on the y-axis I have time, the neuron usually has an initial transient, and then it, the activity sort of settled, settles down to some value, right? Now, on the other hand, if the animal is paying attention, this level of activity is elevated, right? So one of the ways in which these um, attention control areas, the prefrontal and parietal cortex, exert their attention control is by modulating activity of uh, the sensory cortices by changing the way information is encoded in these sensory cortices, right? Uh, presumably when you were looking at the change blindness demo and I drew your attention to that stack of books there, uh, perhaps your visual cortex was better encoding that stack of books, right? And then it was saying, oh, well, here's the, here's the difference, right? So this is sort of how forebrain control of attention is thought to work. <clears throat> and, uh, you know, I'm only presenting a very, very high-level overview of all this in the interests of time. I'll be constantly presenting references in the lower uh, right corner or somewhere in the bottom. You're very welcome to look these up. <clears throat> um, <clears throat> now... Uh, you know, this, uh, the critical importance of these areas in attention is highlighted by certain kinds of uh, syndromes. In this case, uh, the syndrome called spatial neglect arises due to damage to a particular part of the brain called the, the parietal cortex, right? The one that we just saw in the previous slide. If either due to organic damage or due to lesions or something like this, if that part of the brain gets damaged, you get a very pronounced deficit. And uh, how does the deficit manifest? <coughs> So let's say you present a, a patient with a spatial hemineglect with a model like this, right? And you ask them to copy it. This is what they produce. They produce something that is, you know, only one half of the picture is retained. The other half is completely missing. And it's, it's very surprising why this happens. It turns out that it's not because they're blind in one half of visual space, right? There have been very careful experiments done that confirm that they're not blind. It just turns out that they're ignoring that half of visual space, right? So they're unable to attend to that half of visual space. It's a, it's a very interesting um, uh, sort of attentional deficit that arises due to damage of the parietal cortex. <clears throat> now, in the context of attention, this is the uh, next phenomenon that's going to be uh, very interesting for the rest of the talk. So I thought I'd give a little bit of background on this. These are neural oscillations. So what are these oscillations? So let's say I take an electrode array. This is like a sort of a bed of nail electrode array, right? So we've got lots of little metal wires that are arranged in a uh, sort of an N by N grid. In this case, something like a 10 by 10 grid. And I implant this in the brain. And I record not the activity of individual neurons, but sort of the summed activity in a local population, right? The net currents flowing through a local population then I get fluctuations of what's called the local field potential, right? So this, you can think of this very loosely as the summed activity of a collection of neurons. So that's only a loose analogy, but you can think of it that way. And so you can actually see this very nice fluctuations that happen in the local field potential that are recorded from these various electrode arrays in the brain, right? So the brain's, you know, primarily uh, processing and communicating information through electrical activity, right? Um, <clears throat> Well, electrochemical activity, but yeah. So here we are recording the electrical activity of the brain. Now you can see that if I record individual units or spikes, uh, these tend to line up, you know, so each of these is dots happens when a neuron spikes, right? This axis is time and this axis is neurons. So I put a dot every time a neuron spikes. You can see that when a lot of neurons spike together, you actually see some sort of a fluctuation in this field potential, like a global fluctuation in this field potential, local field potential. <coughs> And it turns out that under various conditions, these local field potentials exhibit various kinds of oscillations. Uh, many of these oscillations are defined by the frequency bands of interest. There are delta oscillations, theta oscillations, deltas usually during sleep, thetas during uh, memory, there's alpha oscillations, beta oscillations, and then there's finally gamma oscillations, which are sort of the fastest oscillations that we study. 
And uh, these gamma oscillations will be of particular interest for attention. Right? Um, in a seminal study in science in, um, in the early 2000s, uh, Fries and colleagues showed that these gamma oscillations are critical, you know, are, are a key signature of attention. And how did they show this? They um, had a, an electrode recording visual activity in a monkey that was performing an attention task and then they recorded the local field potential, right? So this blue trace here is the local field potential. You can see the activities are going up and down, right? But when the animal started paying attention to the location defined, you know, where the electrode was recording activity from, <coughs> the oscillations started to synchronize into this beautiful pattern, right? This very rhythmic pattern, which happens to be in this 30 to 90 hertz band called the gamma band. So this led to the speculation that these gamma oscillations could be involved um, in attention control and they could be a signature of attention being paid to a particular region of space because the neurons that tend to encode that region of space synchronize in the gamma band during attention, right? <coughs> There's another key idea that I will introduce. Uh, this is the idea of spike field coherence. So if I record the LFP on one hand, and if I record the spiking activity, that is the activity of single units, single neurons on the other hand, and just like before, I'm putting this in a rasterized represent representation here. Every tick mark here corresponds to a particular unit firing. Um, <clears throat> what you see is that these tick marks tend to align at a particular phase of the LFP, right? They tend to generally occur when there's a trough of the LFP. And this phase locking between units and the LFP is called spike field coherence. And another the key observation in a subsequent paper was that spike field coherence is also enhanced in the gamma band during attention, right? So the spikes tend to phase lock much more with the LFPs, with these field oscillations during attention. So I should say that, uh, you know, because I know that the audience here is incredibly heterogeneous, so if there's any questions, feel free to, uh, you know, ask me. Um, I'm happy to clarify anything as we go along the way. I time myself. I have, I'm short by 15 minutes, so I need questions to fill the time. So, <laughs> all right. Uh, <clears throat> so, um, very recent work has begun to show that it's not just the forebrain, it's not just these cortical areas, but it's also the midbrain that uh, has a key role in attention, and right, right? And specifically, the part of the brain that I'm referring to uh, is a, a structure called the superior colliculus, which is buried deep within the midbrain here, deep within the brain. Uh, it's an evolutionarily ancient structure. It's been preserved across uh, several classes of animals, like right? fish have it, uh, amphibians have it, reptiles, uh, you know, the birds, and so forth. <coughs> and uh, uh, we are interested in understanding uh, the properties of this midbrain structure and how it's responsible for um, our ability to pay attention, right? <clears throat> but rather than studying this in humans or uh, non-human primates, where the colliculus is actually really small compared to the rest of the brain, um, for my postdoc, I studied this structure in the avian brain, right, in the bird brain, uh, the reason is as follows. <clears throat> this is the forebrain of the bird and this is the midbrain, right? So the superior colliculus is also called the optic tectum in the bird um, and also in these other uh, lower classes of animals. <clears throat> and so you can see that the relative size of the midbrain to the forebrain is very different in the birds, right? It's almost as big as the forebrain in birds and so it becomes very easy to access and study. So this is why uh, we decided to study uh, the optic tectum in birds. Uh, the optic tectum is also very nicely characterized in birds. It receives both visual and auditory input, and it projects to brainstem nuclei that drive eye movements and orienting behaviors, right? Yeah. Is that a good reason why it's so large? Uh, I think it's really the other way around. I think it's that the forebrain is actually you know, smaller in these animals, but yeah, that's just a guess. Uh, <clears throat> so, um, yeah, well, I should state that it's only relative sizes. The absolute size of this brain is really small compared to the size of a human brain, right? It would be about a tenth or less. Uh, <clears throat> so why is this an attractive feature for a structure that encodes attention, right? So why would you want something to receive visual and auditory inputs and also project to brain, uh, brainstorm structures that control eye movements? So imagine that you're trying to focus on you know, this presentation here and then suddenly a cell phone goes off somewhere, right? Or there's a sudden bright flash of light, your attention would be automatically drawn to that location, right? So any location that's 
important for orienting attention should receive these kinds of inputs and even more specifically the calliculus turns out to have a spatial code for these inputs it can even tell you exactly where it's getting that input from and uh, when you uh, hear that cell phone generally you don't sort of orient and keep quiet you move your eyes right you generally turn and orient to see oh what's going on there right so then that sort of eye movement is also directly under the control of the calliculus so it's thought to be a very um, you know, crucial structure for attention and, you know, some of the evidence later will also show. <coughs> um, <coughs> yeah. So there's another reason why uh, we study the calliculus in birds uh, uh, rather than in, in uh, lower classes of animals and the reason is because there's a very strong homology between the mammalian superior calliculus and the avian optic tectum. Right, so there's superficial layers, that is the layers more towards the surface of the calliculus that receive visual input, and the deeper layers project to these motor structures. And there's a whole host of nuclei and homologous cortical structures which send and receive connections from the calliculus. These are very similar between mammals and birds, and by studying the optic tectum in birds, we hope to uncover some key principles that can also be relevant to mammals. Right? And there's one other cool reason why uh, we need to uh, study attention and the optic tectum in birds. I thought I'd just present this, uh, this nice video that, uh, okay, let's see this volume here. Oh, I'm not getting, uh, getting volume, but I think you should be able to see uh, what is going on. Um, what, actually, what I'm going to do is I'm going to remove this and, uh, <coughs> Let's see if I can get my mic uh, close enough to the uh, speaker. Receive sound at a slightly different volume and angle. Can people hear what is going on? really see how powerfully the, uh, the bird is using uh, its sense of hearing and its ability to focus and stay on focus and on the target and so forth and get to it, right? So uh, not only birds of prey like the owl, but it turns out that even uh, birds that get predated upon like pigeons and so forth have a fantastic ability to pay attention and you'll, you'll sort of see that in the upcoming uh, slides. Uh, <clears throat> So uh, the broad outline of the presentation is this. I'm going to cover um, you know, some key aspects of the neural code in the optic tectum. And uh, to give away a little bit of the, uh, the answer, it turns out that the neural code is in terms of gamma oscillations. Then I'll cover some key circuit mechanisms that allow the optic tectum to generate these gamma oscillations. Finally, we'll look at the role of the, um, the circuit that generates gamma oscillations in attention behaviors. And finally, uh, time permitting, I'll very briefly synthesize this into a broader framework of how attention works in the brain, right? Um, so um, the, the initial part of this work was done in owls. So this was done in the owl optic tectum. And so we are going to ask, uh, what is the neural code in the owl optic tectum? How does the optic tectum encode visual and auditory stimuli? Now, how do we do this? <coughs> So we have the owl uh, lightly sedated, right, with nitrous sitting in a chamber. Um, and, uh, you know, we have a, a very fine microwire electrode lowered into the optic tectum of the bird uh, while the animal is being presented with stimuli on a tangent screen, right? So the bird is sort of looking like this and there's a stimulus that's being presented on the screen. 
Uh, typically, what we present and what drives OT responses very well are moving dots because owls track these small prey, right? So they like to see these little moving dots. Uh, <clears throat> so if you stick an electrode in the superficial layers of the tectum, that is sort of at the surface of the tectum, and we present a small moving dot, here's what we see. We see periodic bursts of activity. These are almost like conventional spikes, but clusters of spikes, right? So for those of you who've seen spike waveforms, these are action potential bursts, right? Bursting discharges, but the interburst interval itself is very rhythmic. You can see that there's a burst once every so often, right? And it turns out that this rhythmicity is almost exactly in the gamma band. It's around 40 hertz, which is in the 30 to 90 hertz um, uh, gamma band. Now, if I measure local field potentials in this same location, um, essentially what I need to do for that is to open up my filters and allow the, uh, the, the sort of the broadband response to come in. What I see is this beautiful fluctuating oscillation in the gamma band in response to a briefly moving visual stimulus. Right? And the microstructure of the oscillations is shown here, and I'll get to this in the next couple of slides, uh, zoomed in. <coughs> Now, it turns out that both visual and auditory stimuli produce gamma band oscillations. Uh, what I'm showing you here is a, a spectrogram. A spectrogram shows you spectral power, that is power at a particular frequency on the y-axis and at a particular time on the x-axis. So when I present a little visual stimulus here, as shown by the black bar, you can actually see an immediate increase in power in this frequency band, which is the gamma band, right? So there's this burst of gamma band activity as soon as I present a visual stimulus. It turns out that it doesn't have to be a visual stimulus. If I present an auditory stimulus, I also get fairly similar activity. I also get fairly strong gamma band responses. So for both visual and auditory stimuli, you have gamma responses. And it turns out that there, these gamma responses have some very interesting properties, right? One of which is that they encode space. They are spatially tuned. What do I mean by this? <coughs> If I present a, a little moving stimulus and then move it around all over the screen, right? So I present the moving stimulus here and there and there and so forth. There is only one particular location at which this site where I'm recording from will show very strong gamma oscillations. At other locations, it sort of dies away. And that's shown by this tuning curve here. The, for the aficionados, the tuning curve width is fairly sharp. Right? So you can actually see that uh, it's only of the order of a few degrees. The, width, the full width at half maximum is only of the order of a few degrees. And this precision of coding is perhaps what underlies the ability to, of the animal to really focus on, um, you know, on stimuli that are that far away with incredible precision. Right? Yeah. Not here. We've tranquilized it. So we've actually, it's uh, sort of, um, it's very still. Right? So we've tranquilized it and we've immobilized it. So it's, uh, it's completely still. <coughs> Now, gamma oscillations also have this interesting property that they encode the salience of stimuli. Right? So if I present a stimulus and it slowly uh, becomes brighter in contrast, or if I present a stimulus that is uh, initially of uh, you know, sort of a weak sound and then a very strong sound, the strength of gamma oscillations is a, an index of how strong that sound is. So the strength increases with increasing either visual contrast or auditory intensity. Right? So this is, again, a really important property for something that's going to drive your orienting responses based on salience. So if something is really salient, that's going to drive a barrage of gamma band responses that could then potentially mediate the orienting response, right? <coughs> and it also turns out that these gamma oscillations have different properties in the superficial versus deep layers. Uh, this characteristic will become interesting in the, uh, uh, when we get to the circuits and mechanisms. <coughs> So if I record oscillations in the superficial layers, you saw how they looked. But if I move this electrode and, uh, you know, into the deeper layers of the tectum and I record these same LFP and spike responses, here what you see is a little more of a mixed bag. It's not really as clean an oscillation as what we saw in the superficial layers. If I do a spectral analysis on this, this is exactly what it shows. It shows that in the superficial layers, there's a very clean peak. So again, the spectrum here shows the power on the y-axis and the frequency on the x-axis. And it shows a very clean peak here in the gamma band in the superficial layers, suggesting that it's a very narrow band oscillation. But in the deeper layers, it's much more broadband. Uh, nevertheless, there's a little bit of a hint of this peak in the, um, in, in the gamma band, right? So the, the spectral characteristics are different in the two layers, and we get to that in the, in the next part. <coughs> 
Um, also, uh, if you remember the spike LFP coherence that I mentioned some time back, what you see here in the microstructure of these oscillations is spike LFP coherence quite similar to the spike LFP coherence that you see in the visual cortex of primates, right? So what do I mean by spike LFP coherence? I mentioned that this is the spikes phase locking with the LFP, right? So the LFP is this waveform here that's going at this very slow rate, whereas the spikes are these waveforms in black that are going at a very high rate, right? And you can see this burst of spiking activity happens pretty much just before the trough of this LFP, right? That's what I mean by spike LFP coherence. And you can quantify this uh, using various metrics, and it turns out that you have a, a very strong face locking of the spikes with the LFPs. <clears throat> Is this a, something completely unique to birds, some, some anomaly that we don't care about? Uh, it turns out that it's not unique only to birds and primates. It's actually there in various other mammals as well. So in a, uh, in a recent review, we've, we've reviewed uh, how similar these oscillations are across different classes of animals. So if you actually look in the cat visual cortex, these were recordings, I believe, in the uh, early 80s or late 80s. And you can actually see this uh, slow LFP waveform and these bursts of spikes that lock to per a particular phase of the LFP. You actually see something very similar in the mouse visual cortex. Uh, you also see something very similar in the mouse somatosensory cortex. Somatosensory cortex is a part of the brain that encodes touch-related information, right? So you actually see these slow fluctuations in the LFP and these bursts of spikes that face lock to the LFP. And it's also there in other birds, like pigeons, for instance. So it turns out that this is a fairly ubiquitous code. And then the question arises as to what are the mechanisms that, that produce this, these gamma oscillations? OK. Yeah. Uh, yeah, that's a good point. Uh, it turns out that, uh, you know, the spikes that we're talking about here are a, a unique kind of spike. I'll get to it in the circuits and uh, mechanisms. Uh, but there's, there's two answers to that. The first answer is uh, not all spikes lead to local field potentials, right? Synchronized spikes lead generally to strong fluctuations in the local field potential. So a strong coherence between the local field potential and the spikes is an indicator of synchrony happening at the network level. So that's the broad answer. But in the, in the more specific case, um, you will see that it's a unique class of spikes, right? And it's, uh, you know, again, for the aficionados, these are very similar to the chattering cells that have been recorded in the, uh, in the neocortex. So um, it's, a, it's a different class of spikes. I'll just talk about it. Yeah. Next question. Uh, that's, that's a good question. Um, I don't know. It, I guess it would depend on what sign you assume for peaks and troughs, whether it's you know, current going inward or current going outward. Uh, and a biophysical model can sort of address that. It can, uh, I'll, I'll point later to a biophysical model that shows how this alignment comes about. <coughs> All right. So what are the uh, circuit mechanisms that generate these gamma oscillations? Right? So, um, and, you know, potentially studying these circuit mechanisms can give us clues about how the oscillations happen in these other classes of animals as well. That's why it's, it's quite interesting to do this uh, in birds. Uh, but before I get into uh, the circuit mechanisms, I should tell you something about the circuit itself. <coughs> so this is a schematic of the circuit that I showed you before. This is a section through the optic tectum. So this is, the, this is a slice through the optic tectum, right, a very thin slice. Um, and you can actually see this beautiful layered structure of the tectum, which is what is schematized here. Now, in addition to this tectum, the midbrain also contains certain other nuclei. You can see little clusters of cells here. Usually, these nuclei consist of homogeneous groups of cells. That's, that's commonly what makes up a nucleus. And in this particular case, the nucleus that we're interested in is a nucleus called the IPC. Uh, the nucleus is my pars, uh, parvocellularis, consisting of small cell bodies. And it turns out that, very interestingly, the IPC contains primarily cholinergic neurons, right? And there's another important circuit detail that I should mention before moving on, which is that uh, this is, you know, again, a schematic of the tectum. This is a tectal cell shown here. And we know that the tectum receives both visual and auditory input. But tectal cells project to the IPC, right? Tectal cells in a particular part of the tectum project to a small part of the IPC. And cells in the IPC project back to the same region of the tectum from which they received input. 
So this makes for like a one-to-one -one feedback loop between the tectum and the IPC, right? So this is going to be a very important component of what generates gamma oscillations uh, coming up next. <coughs> okay, so we'd like to understand the mechanisms of these gamma oscillations, but it, this is very hard to do in vivo, right? Because you need access to all of these circuit elements that generate these gamma oscillations. It turns out that it's, uh, you know, easier to do this in vitro in, in, by in vitro, what I mean is we take slices of the tectum and then study it in a dish, right? <coughs> and so this is a midbrain slice preparation that, um, that we've used to understand the mechanisms of gamma oscillations. You can actually see the optic tectum here. This is the, um, uh, you know, the, this very uh, thin transparent thing you see here, that's the optic tectum. In a very thin slice, there's only a few tens of microns thick. <coughs> Then you have a stimulating electrode. This is an electrode that delivers brief pulses of current, right? And that current is required to sort of uh, buzz the optic tectum to make it produce some responses, right? Because we want to study how the optic tectum generates these oscillations. So we need a way to stimulate it. Remember that in the intact animal, the eyes were providing the input, but this is an isolated section of the brain. It's not even connected to the forebrain, right? So it's completely isolated section of the brain. And we have an eight channel recording rake here that covers various areas of the tectum. You can also record across depth and so forth. And you can also record simultaneously from the IPC, right? This is a very hard to see here uh, because it usually has to be stained in order to be uh, seen clearly. But you can actually see, um, you know, a very thin watery nucleus and that's, that's the IPC. <coughs> All right. So what happens in this particular setup, it's called an interface chamber, which uh, keeps the health of these slices live. So they're actually like a living uh, piece of brain tissue on this chamber, right? And what happens if we deliver a brief a buzz of current to this pulse of tissue, it turns out, that for this piece of tissue, it turns out that it generates beautiful gamma oscillations that are actually quite remarkably similar to the oscillations that you see in the live animal, right? Just this piece of tissue. Uh, generates these gamma oscillations. <clears throat> so, you know, uh, so with broader implications for the role of gamma oscillations in consciousness, but I'm not going to get into that. Uh, but uh, what's, what's actually, what you're seeing here is this, this very strong correspondence between the gamma oscillations you see in a live animal um, and these, these very similar oscillations that you see in a, uh, in a brain slice, right? And you can also see that the spectral power is, is very, very similar. Right, so you actually see this very strong correspondence between these two oscillations. And now, uh, this is a bit of a lucky break, and this gave us a chance to go in and measure all the properties of these oscillations by messing with this tissue. <coughs> um, so I'm going to cut a long story short by just presenting two key findings, uh, one of which is, what is the role of the IPC in generating these oscillations? Now, I wouldn't mention so much about it if it didn't have a role. So what we did is we went in and transected the IPC out of this slice, right? So this is, you know, a normal oscillation that's produced, you know, in an intact slice. But then if you transect the IPC out or you inactivate it with various blockers and so forth, what actually happens is that these oscillations completely go away, right? So you don't actually see any oscillations in the tectum once the IPC is out of the picture. <coughs> There's Again, this is a slide for the aficionados. There's, there's a prevalent theory that inhibition is really important for the control of the structure of these oscillations. But the IPC, if you remember, is a cholinergic nucleus, right? It doesn't have any GABAergic neurons. So uh, we wondered, uh, you know, where would be this source of the inhibition that shaped the structure of these oscillations. So we tested this by puffing a particular chemical known as picrotoxin, which uh, blocks inhibition. It blocks GABAergic inhibition. We puffed this in the tectum in the uh, intermediate layers that actually project to the IPC. And what we see is actually a disruption of the structure of the oscillations. So the oscillations no longer look like gamma oscillations. But once the picrotoxin washes away, the oscillations come back again. Right? So that is this, um, you know, this burst of activity, that you, periodic burst of activity that you're seeing here. Um, on the other hand, as expected, the PTX puff and IPC, which has no inhibition, uh, you know, inhibitory neurons uh, fail to produce uh, any kind of uh, effect on the structure of the oscillation. So inhibition in the OT turns out to be the key. And uh, later, we actually identified a group of uh, parvalbumin positive inhibitory neurons in the intermediate layers of the tectum. And uh, we've hypothesized, we speculate that these uh, parvalbumin positive inhibitory neurons may actually be responsible for generating these gamma oscillations in the, in the slice, right? 
And so putting all this data together, we are developing a biophysically realistic model for how these gamma oscillations could be generated. On the left-hand side is the data, and on the right-hand side is the model. Uh, the left-hand side is actually a patch recording from an IPC neuron that was published along with this paper, uh, with, the, with the previous paper. And on the right-hand side is actually a, uh, a model that can produce this sort of bursting activity of these IPC neurons. Uh, right? And once you put the whole circuit together, along with the tectum and the associated inhibitory components and so forth, you actually get oscillations in the model that look quite similar to the oscillations that you actually see in the data. This is actually data and this is the model. And you can actually see how this very nice uh, face locking between these bursts of spikes and the slower local field potential is also replicated in the model. Right? <coughs> so. Um, Again, if you're interested, I can talk to you more about this. This is a, 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 a study in preparation. <clears throat> so to summarize the, these first two sections of the talk, um, we developed a, a neural circuit model for how the midbrain generates its gamma oscillations. Right? Um, so the midbrain receives both visual and auditory inputs. And it has these paralbumin positive inhibitory neurons sitting in these intermediate layers that are between the superficial and deep layers. And these neurons project to the IPC, right? Um, but these paralbumin positive neurons are sufficient to generate a very weak gamma signature, right? It's not a very strong signature, but they're sufficient to generate something that is weak. And once this activity goes to the IPC and then is fed back to the tectum, then this feedback loop amplifies, selectively amplifies these gamma band oscillations so that you see a very nice gamma signature in the superficial layers of the tectum. And again, for, uh, for people who care about the details, we believe this is happening because the IPC neurons themselves are resonant at these gamma frequencies. They have bursting activity that is resonant at these gamma frequencies, and that leads to an um, sort of a gain increase in the gamma band power of these <coughs> oscillations, right? <coughs> Okay, uh, well, we also know that the forebrain and the key areas that are important for attention control in the forebrain, the homologue of the, uh, of the prefrontal cortex, uh, project to both the tectum and the IPC, and there's some ongoing work that seeks to understand how the forebrain itself could shape these gamma oscillations that, that happen in the midbrain, right? <clears throat> okay, so I'm going to move on to the last section of the talk. Any questions um, so far? Yeah. Uh, yeah, that's a good question. Uh, we don't see so much of those in this network. Uh, we are primarily studying the midbrain network, and we don't see that you know very strong alpha power. We did see a little bit of theta power, but no, we didn't go after that. Um, yeah, that's something interesting for for future work. <coughs> okay, so um, so far I've told you about circuit mechanisms and a particular type of neural code called the gamma oscillation. But what does this have to do with attention, right? So how would this circuit play a role in attention? And how does it play a role in attention? And obviously, we can't study that in slice. We have to study that in the living animal. And so for that, uh, we developed a uh, behavioral model for measuring attention behaviors. Uh, <clears throat> now, initially, we were a bit naive, and we started working with owls um, <clears throat> uh, for, for training them to do behavioral tasks. But it turns out that uh, while owls do fantastic behaviors in the wild, they will not be trained. They refuse to be trained. They're very stubborn. Uh, they're actually predatory animals that can go for days or months, you know, weeks without water or food. So we just gave up that enterprise. And we decided instead to, you know, uh, look a little bit closer to home, uh, to the domestic chicken, actually, uh, which we realized can actually be trained to do fantastic uh, tasks of attention. They're, they're very, very good and they can be readily trained to perform these tasks. The primary reason being they're readily motivated, right? The, a, a little chick or, a, you know, a, uh, uh, even a grown bird is actually fairly hungry most of the time. So if you, you know, use uh, classical conditioning, you can train them to do pretty much whatever you want. And you may have seen some of these videos that, uh, you know, where the, the chick is performing a huge sequence of behaviors, right? And so this is actually something that um, uh, we discovered that we could also train. Uh, so how does this, this task work, right? Before I show you the video, I'll actually walk you through a, a couple of key points. <clears throat> so this bird, as you can see, is sort of sitting in front of this uh, screen, is actually seated, uh, and a little fixation cross comes up in the center. The bird pecks once in the fixation cross, and as soon as he pecks, a stimulus comes up on either side of the fixation cross, right? So there's, there's this cross here, he pecks here, and a stimulus can come up on either side. 
This stimulus is usually a grating stimulus, right? So it can be either a horizontal grating or a, um, a vertical grating. A grating is essentially just a series of uh, dark and bright bands, right? Alternating dark and bright bands. So it can actually be a, a horizontal grating or it can be like this, like a vertical grating, right? <clears throat> and what the bird is trained to do is to report the orientation of the grating. Is it horizontal or is it vertical? Now, how is he going to report that? As soon as the stimulus disappears, a response box shows a little box that comes up on the side of the stimulus. If it is a horizontal grating, the bird goes and pecks on the box. If it's a vertical grating, he just ignores the box and continues to press, uh, peck at the center, right? So he's going to indicate this with a two alternative sort of force choice paradigm. It's also thought of as a go, no go paradigm where if it's one kind of grating, he goes and pecks on the box. If it's another kind of grating, he continues to peck on the cross, right? Yeah. How was it trained to do that? Well, it's, it's actually a process. So you actually get them adjusted to the chamber, and then you train them to you know, peck on the screen, and then you train. So surprisingly fast. In about two months, we could have the bird trained on this task. The comparative time for getting monkeys to sit on a chair is about six months. So. <laughs> <laughs> uh -huh. Uh, I, I'm just I'm just kidding. <laughs> so, uh, okay. So, can everybody see that? So, it's actually the task is going to go very fast, right? So, uh, there's there's a freeze frame. You can see a um, in this case it's a vertical grating. So he just ignores the box and continues to peck on the cross. Now this is a horizontal grating, right? So he's got to go and peck on the box, and which he does, right? So this goes over and over and you know the indicator this little green square here means that the, the bird got it right and this is a sequence of trials where he actually got everything right right now let me introduce you to one more thing you actually see two circles appearing here right occasionally there's one circle appearing on one side there's a red circle on one side and occasionally there's two green circles one on either side what are these things <coughs> so these circles are spatial cues right Pictures of worms instead of gratings. Uh, well, they learn how to, you know, discriminate gratings, and then, you know, our reviewers said, you know, we we only know how gratings work in the primate <laughs> visual system. So it is. <laughs> so anyway, so. Yeah, no, so, yeah, so they they're they're really smart, so they can they can learn things very quickly. So. Um, so the, the cues really are uh, sort of giving the animal advanced information about where the stimulus is going to appear, right? So the single red cue that you saw indicates with 100% validity where the upcoming rating is going to appear. The two green rings that you saw are sort of a neutral cue. So they don't tell the animal where the upcoming rating is going to appear. It can appear on the left or the right. Remember that the cue doesn't tell the animal what the correct answer is, right? It's not going to tell the animal whether the grating is horizontal or vertical. It's just going to tell the animal where it's going to show up, right? So this sort of spatial predictive cueing is known to also enhance, uh, you know, attention and enhance performance in humans performing this kind of task. And the way it does this is presumably by drawing your attention to its location, right? Because if you know something is going to happen somewhere, you tend to attend to that location, right? And so this is actually what we saw in these birds. Uh, we actually saw that, so what I'm plotting here on the x-axis, you can think of as a measure of the strength of the grating, right, as a contrast to the grating. So the brighter gratings are on the, uh, on the right side and dimmer gratings are on the left side. And on the um, y-axis, I have accuracy. That is, uh, how well did the bird perform? Um, and here on the y-axis, I have response times, right? So what happens is in the presence of a valid predictive cue shown here, this red curve and the red points here, the animal actually performs better compared to when there is no cue or this neutral cue. And similarly, his response times also go down in the presence of a valid uh, a cue, valid predictive cue, indicating that he's able to make decisions more quickly, not only more accurately, but he's also able to make decisions quickly. And it turns out that these signatures are actually very similar to what you see in humans uh, trained to perform these kinds of tasks, right? So, uh, you know, the, um, the sort of signatures of behavior that we saw in birds were actually similar to those in humans. And there's one particular um, point that I wish to highlight here, which is that um, when you present the bird with distractors, right, things that are irrelevant to the task at hand, 
they, these destructors degrade performance. So what did we do? Um, I didn't show this uh, in the movie here. So we actually presented some bright dots that match the grating in terms of size that could appear either on the same side as the grating or on the opposite side as the grating. They would appear simultaneously with the grating, but they would carry no orientation information, right? Those dots would just be bright dots, right? Now it turns out that as you, this is what this axis actually means, as you increase the contrast of those dots relative to the contrast of the grating, right? So here the distractors are way brighter than the grating, and here the distractors are way dimmer than the grating. The grating is the target stimulus to which the animal must pay attention. You actually find that regardless of whether he's cued or not, his performance goes down, right? So because the, as the distractors become more and more brighter, they become more and more distracting and his performance goes down. But nevertheless, when he's cued, his performance is better than when he's not cued, especially for these distractors of intermediate strengths, right? So this is sort of what we found in, uh, uh, and this has also been shown in humans, that distractors, things that are task irrelevant, but so still grab your attention, like a sudden cell phone going off in the hall, will still degrade your performance, will impede your ability to listen to what I'm saying, right? Okay, so now uh, in the interest of time, I'm going to go through the next uh, section fairly quickly. <coughs> So what happens, because this is what we set out to answer, what happens to this kind of uh, task performance when we lesion the OT or the IPC, right? So um, it turns out that the effects are qualitatively similar, but quantitatively way more dramatic with OT lesions compared with IPC lesions, but the effects are quite similar. So here's a section through the OT and the IPC that shows you the, um, you know, the optic tectum here and a little lesion here placed in the IPC. Uh, let me draw your attention primarily to this panel here. So in a lesion bird, before the lesion and after the lesion, the bird's performance uh, in the presence of strong distractors, right? You can see that he actually goes to chance. Um, once the lesion is made, the same stimuli with this, at the same strength of distractors really drives his performance to chance. So it turns out that one of the key signatures of attention that we saw before, that of distractors degrading performance, becomes way more pronounced in these birds that have lost an OT or an IPC, that have lost part of the OT or part of the IPC, right? <clears throat> but the story does not end here because this raised one more puzzle. Now what is the puzzle? The puzzle is that, if you remember, the task that we are training the bird on is an orientation discrimination task, right? So he's telling whether you know, a grating is horizontal or vertical, and it turns out that neither the OT nor the IPC actually processes any information about orientation. Information about orientation is primarily processed in the forebrain, um, usually in an area called Wolston birds and you know, obviously in various visual areas and primates, <coughs> um, including V1, right? So it turns out that actually taking out the OT or IPC shouldn't actually impede the bird's ability to discriminate orientations because the information processing is happening in the forebrain and that should presumably be intact, right? And there was, um, so that's the sort of source of the puzzle. Like if you take out the midbrain, why is the bird going to chance even though the task requires a decision that's based on information in the forebrain, right? Sensory information in the forebrain. And it turns out that uh, just a few years ago, um, Xenon and Krauslis published this very influential study in Nature which showed, uh, if you remember, Right? I showed you how um, you know, attention enhances the responses of neurons in the visual cortex, right? presumably through um, top-down control operating from forebrain attentional systems. What they did was a heroic experiment where they inactivated the colliculus but also did recordings in the visual cortex. Right? And what they found was that there was actually no difference whatsoever. So even though the colliculus was inactivated, information processing in the forebrain is actually intact. You actually see the same kind of attentional enhancement in forebrain neurons. So what is going on here, right? So uh, this looks like there's a huge disconnect between these two systems, right? So, and, but how can then they both be involved in attention? So that's a huge puzzle for us. So um, again, in the next sort of two and a half minutes, I'm gonna compress uh, sort of the last three years of work trying Spend, uh, trying to uh, spend trying to answer this question um, into two slides. So pardon me if this goes by you know very fast, um, but it turns out that the answer to this question is actually 
uh, you know, another question, and that question is, is attention a unitary phenomenon, right? Is attention just one thing, or is there more than one thing when we say attention, right? It turns out that there is. So let me give you a sort of an intuitive example of what those components of attention are. <coughs> The two components of attention that I'm referring to are called sensitivity and bias, right? So let me give you a, a everyday example of what is going on here. So let's say you're driving along a road, along a freeway, let's say, and you're paying attention to the vehicle that's directly in front of you, right? In your own lane, directly in front of you. So you want to make sure you pay attention there because, you know, any maneuvers that that guy makes is going to have, like, you know, important consequences for you, right? So that guy breaks suddenly, you have to break. Otherwise, you're going to hit that person. So what are the consequences of paying attention? <coughs> One possibility is that this vehicle directly in front becomes somehow perceptually clearer, right? Your visual system encodes that information and processes it better so that, for instance, you are able to read off that person's number plate better. That's one possible consequence of attention. And usually what happens is that that happens at a cost to the other information, right? So this vehicle actually becomes more blurry than it was before. So your visual processing ability at this other location sort of goes down. This is one potential consequence of attention, one possible component. What's the other component? The other component is it's possible that there's really no difference in terms of your visual processing capacity, right? In terms of the actual visual processing in each of these locations. It's just that you're biased more towards this location for making decisions. So you decide that I'm going to you know, only take into account information that arises from this lane. You can afford to do this in the US, you can't afford to do this in India, but anyway. So <laughs> you're going to take into account only information from this vehicle and for instance, ignore vehicles that are on the other side of the median, right? So obviously if some truck breaks on the other side of the median, you really don't care, right? Um, so this is sort of a differential weighting mechanism of attention. So this is in concept distinct from the sensitivity uh, enhancement component of attention. And uh, to cut, a, a, as I mentioned, a very, very long story short, um, <coughs> what we discovered based on developing a um, a multidimensional model for uh, the analysis of multi-alternative decisions, which are the kinds of decisions that um, you know, we generally make in the everyday world, it turns out that the effects of midbrain inactivation or midbrain manipulation can be consistently explained by changes of bias, whereas potentially whatever happens in the forebrain is primarily due to changes in sensitivity, right? So this is still a model. This is just a hypothesis, a schema, if you will where we propose that there are really two parallel systems for attention. One system that's, for example, including the prefrontal cortex, that's important for controlling sensitivity to sensory information. That is one component of attention. And another system that is important for controlling your bias for making decisions, right? So the other uh, part of the driving example that I gave. And this system comprises the colliculus, the subcortical structure. Whereas this system comprises, uh, you know, the prefrontal cortex and potentially other uh, uh, forebrain areas. Together, these in pieces of information have to combine when making a decision. So why is information processing intact when the colliculus is inactivated? This diagram explains it because these proceed along parallel paths. So there's no reason for this information processing in the forebrain to be affected because the colliculus was inactivated. But at the time of making decisions, the colliculus has to allow the animal to get that information to drive behavior, right? So the colliculus is getting that information. So even though orientation, discrimination, information is still impact in, intact in the forebrain, the colliculus simply prevents that information from gaining access to behavior. So the animal is at essentially a chance when doing this task. And this also explains the sort of puzzling finding in the Lovejoy, uh, in the, sorry, the Xenon and Krausler study, which showed that, uh, you know, uh, that forebrain processing was intact even though the midbrain had been inactivated, right? So, um, and you know, we are uh, sort of uh, added some components to this and we are currently exploring how actually the gamma code itself in the midbrain could be driving the spatial bias for making decisions. Again, for details, I refer you to our uh, more recent papers. <coughs> so, this schema, as you can see, has nothing specific to do with any class of animals. So, we've actually moved into uh, testing this uh, schema in humans, 
uh, it turns out, uh, fortunately again for us, that you can actually record both activity and connectivity in the calliculus. Uh, this is my ongoing work here at uh, the Center for Neuroscience. Um, and we can record activity not only in the calliculus, but also very reliably in these prefrontal and parietal cortical areas using functional imaging and connectivity between the calliculus and many of these areas using diffusion imaging. Um, and we're also looking uh, to build collaborations uh, based on the, uh, the Wellcome Trust grant to uh, measure neural oscillations uh, using electrocorticography in patients with intractable epilepsy, right? So these patients have grids of electrodes implanted on the surface of their brains. And so from these, we can record these gamma band and alpha band oscillations and look at their role in attention behaviors. Uh, so with that, um, I'd like to acknowledge the people who are making a lot of this work, uh, the, the ongoing work happen. This is the Cognition Lab at, uh, at CNS. And um, acknowledgments also to the people who are involved in the experiments that I discussed in this uh, presentation, my collaborators at various universities and the funding agencies. Thank you and happy to take questions. Okay, we have time for two or three burning questions. Uh, one burning question. So the first question, uh, I don't have enough expertise in EEG to answer that question, uh, but um, you know, uh, I'd be happy to discuss that further if you're interested. Yeah. So that's a question that, uh, you know, potentially there could be an answer to. So there is, um, you know, obviously the reason why we filter out um, information during sleep is because things get shut off at the level of the thalamus, right? So it doesn't get related to the cortex. Information doesn't travel to the cortex. Uh, there is one modality that bypasses the thalamus, though, and that is olfaction. So it's been shown very clearly that even some kinds of learning are possible if induced through the olfactory modality, um, you know, um, when a person is sleeping. Uh, but perhaps the reason why, I guess what you're suggesting is why do we hear alarm clocks and not uh, you know, uh, anything else? That may simply be because uh, unlike the eyes where the periphery actually closes up, the ears, the periphery is still open. So the signal can just get through to the thalamus just fine. If it's salient enough, presumably it's gonna wake up the thalamus. That's my best guess. Yeah, so uh, maybe I'm too inspired by Upi sir's talk and trying to recognize patterns. Uh, the slide where you introduced gamma spike and LFP coherence, uh, you uh, kept mentioning the importance of gamma oscillations, right? But in that particular slide, I saw if you take the envelope of this LFP signal, uh, there was a different frequency to it. So was that typical to that particular experiment or there are some other uh, implications? I see. So you're suggesting that there's some oscillation in the amplitude envelope of the LFP. I might be misreading, like... Uh, I don't know. I mean, so we haven't looked at that in very careful detail. It turns out that it's actually a fairly stationary signal that lasts for the duration of the uh, sound. But we've only tested sounds that are about 500 milliseconds at the most 700 milliseconds, right? So uh, it would be interesting to see if there's, you know, um, anything in that. Thank you. Looked at yeah. Last question. No. Last question. Uh, instead of considering only the visual stimuli, if you consider both auditory and visual stimuli, how this attention mechanism jointly together work uh, to better understand the attention mechanisms? Do you mean simultaneously yeah, presenting simultaneously visual and auditory stimuli? Yeah, that's a very interesting question. It's, uh, it's a huge area um, you know, of research because there's a complementary area of research called multisensory integration. Yes, yes. What you're suggesting is an area where the senses compete for attention, right? So we have two potentially different cues. Uh, one visual and one auditory, and they sort of compete for attention. So um, I think that's a, that's a very fertile area of research, um, um, well worth exploring. The unfortunate thing is even we don't know enough even with the single modality, so hopefully once we figure this out, we'll move on to uh, bimodal cues. Cool. Thank you. Let's thank Shridharan again. Uh